This is Beyond the Big Screen Podcast with your host, Steve Guerra. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Big Screen Podcast, where we talk about great movies and stories so great they should be movies. Links to learn more about our guest today can be found in the show notes. You can support Beyond the Big Screen on Patreon.com. By joining on Patreon, you help keep Beyond the Big Screen sustainable and get many great benefits. Go to Patreon.com forward slash Beyond the Big Screen to learn more and sign up. Find show notes, links to subscribe, and leave Apple Podcast reviews by going to our website, BeyondTheBigScreen.com. And now, let's go beyond the big screen. Who doesn't like a little post-apocalyptica, the entire genre of the dystopian future? Post-apocalypse and dystopian fiction waxes and wanes in popularity as people feel that society as a whole is doing well or people feel society is going down the wrong path. Almost every example you can think of in this genre is about decline, fall, and then settling after the big stuff hits the fan moment and hit in the history established by the movie. I'm very much excited to be joined by Chris again today to talk about a book and movie that takes a different look at the whole dystopian future idea, The Postman, the from 1997, based on a book published of the same name in 1985. Using both the novel and the film, Chris and I are going to have a think on how societies fall and how they can recover. Now, Chris, um, in general, I guess what we could start talking about is what do we think about the post-apocalyptic genre in general, uh, m- movies and books? Uh, what do you think about them? I I tend to enjoy them. Like I enjoy, I, I enjoyed The Walking Dead, Mad Max is one. There's a there's a there was a British movie called Doomsday, which I really enjoyed. World War Z was kind of cool. Um, it's not like I don't know some. It's not like my favorite genre, but I generally enjoyed them. It's not like something I turn my nose up to. I like a lot of them, especially there's a couple of um, indie authors who I've read that have really world built. And I think that that's probably the best thing in post-apocalyptic dystopian future type books and movies is that the author or the director gets to build a universe. Yeah. I I haven't read like a ton of, I'm not a big novel reader to be, you know, just to let your audience know, like I've read a a fair amount myself, but it's a, it's a skill that I'm uh, trying to work on, but I get. I guess out of all the major like TV movie like post apocalyptic ones, I I enjoy The Walking Dead and probably the most the first couple of seasons. I stopped watching later on because it got a little too silly in my opinion. But those first couple of seasons I thought were actually really remarkable in terms of the themes that they were tackling and how it was filmed. I like it when they really explore what people do when the world falls and that first couple of days couple of weeks couple of months and i think that that's what the walking dead captured really well and maybe the first season or two and then it just it didn't know where to go plus the show it was started trying to line up with the comic book and how comic books work to doesn't necessarily translate to film or even books. Yeah, that's what I noticed. It was, it really had a sense of they were trying to, they didn't have like a full story written out before they started the show. And then they were just kind of writing it season by season. And it shows in the prod, especially in the later seasons, where they're not exactly sure where they're going with this whole thing. I, like they apparently, like you pointed out, know, they were following with the comics but i mean you could read those comics and be this isn't this isn't going to really work for the type of that we set up in the first couple of seasons for sure to you how does the postman fit into the books and tvs like the walking dead mad max the road to me it had it has a very different flavor and it could have been based on the time it came out in in 1998 but to me i get a very different flavor 
and a, a very different themes tackled in this novel and uh, story, novel and film. I think what makes the Postman unique is, is in most post-apocalyptic uh, movies and books, it's either society collapses and it focuses on how bad it's all become and or how cool it could be, I guess, in the sense of like Mad Max, um, where the Postman society's collapse but the focus is how do you go about bringing society back and i think that's what makes you the postman unique so um maybe let's talk a little bit about what is the the whole idea behind the postman the the movie and the book that was pretty interesting in that the movie and the film took a lot of they went in several different directions from each other, but they both basically had the same big idea. What was kind of the big idea of the postman? The the postman represents the noble lie that ends up becoming the truth, right? Is that how is that that's how I interpreted it? Yeah, I think that that's probably really the the whole theme is that the the big lie, the the lie that really becomes legend and it obscures the the facts i think that that's what was really cool about this is that it sort of peels away or pulls back the curtain on mythology in a way but it's showing that this is myth and legend being created in front of us yeah, well, that's what I, I really liked about the movie because there's I can't think of too many movies that really go about trying to create a, a legitimate myth um, that seems somewhat believable that this guy started off with this idea that, oh, I, I'm going to pretend to be a postman so I can get some cheap meals, and uh, you know, some lodgings once in a while and turns into this. um this bigger thing than he he could ever anticipate. Yeah, and you read about like older myths throughout uh, history, and it, this. And I'll use an example like Odin. Apparently, Odin created the w- runes, right? So Odin probably there probably was a guy named Odin or somebody like Odin who did the rudimentaries of creating the runic alphabet and was attributed to it. Where but kept. Kevin is, or Gordon, you know, we can use the names interchangeably, um, kind of starts off like stumbling into being the postman and inadvertently starts creating a communications network that, you know, leads to the foundations of the recreation of some version of the United States. Yeah, Kevin Costner, who plays the postman, he's really the borderline the only star of the movie uh it's it's kevin costner kevin costner directed it the novel is by david brin uh he's the really he's i wouldn't say he's an anti-hero he's more of the reluctant hero the postman in general in the in the book and in the movie they take slightly different perspectives on the the reluctant hero, but essentially the postman, Kevin Costner, finds uh, an abandoned postal vehicle and he just runs it as a gimmick. He's, oh, he's a postman from the restored United States and he's just going to try and use that grift to just go on from town to town. But it it takes a life of its own. It, yeah, it's interesting. Like at the in the first part of the movie and even the book, he... He struggles with lying about this restored United States and lying to people that he's, you know, he knows the president. But as the as it progresses, it progresses in the movie and the book. He progress. He becomes more and more comfortable saying these things. He gets better at the lie. I would argue that he he ends up believing his own lie as he progresses along his journey. Steve here. We are a member of the Parthenon Podcast Network, featuring great shows like James Early's Key Battles of American History podcast and many other great shows. Go over to ParthenonPodcast.com to learn more. And here is a quick word from our sponsors. I think in the book, more so than in the 
in the movie. In the book, the postman really does believe in reestablishing society. I think that that's maybe the big difference between the book and the movie. In the movie, Kevin Costner is really a loner, and he never really owns that he's created something in the new restored U.S. Postal Service that's something that's way bigger than him. And I, I don't think even at the very end of the movie, he realizes what he's really done. Yeah, we're in the book. Gordon's pretty self-aware of what he's trying to do. Kevin seems to be he seems to be it kind of just stumbles into it and then later realizes that the I think I would argue he realizes that at the end near the end of the movie just how important his lie has become in terms of inspiring the rest of the uh rest of society against the uh wholeness but I th- bringing up the wholeness is a uh, is a good segue to really set up on how this society fell I think that that was one of the things they really don't talk about it at all in the movie The book doesn't really talk about it. It sort of throws in that exposition at a couple of key points in the in the book. But this quote from the book, I think, by the postman in the book, his name is Gordon Krantz. We'll call we'll kind of split between calling him Kevin as in Kevin Costner, the postman and Gordon. But so in this quote, Gordon says That had been the way with the strange, with that strange war, inconsistent, chaotic. It stopped far short of the spasm everyone predicted. Instead, it was more like a shotgun blast of one mid scale catastrophe after another. By itself, any one of the disasters might have been survivable. I think that that's really what separates this book. And what I think probably you get the you get the sense of that's what happened in the film is society just didn't collapse one day like the zombie apocalypse. One day things are pretty cool. The next day it's zombies running all over the uh, the mall. And this it's there was a big war that ended kind of quickly, more quickly than they expected it to. And the United States nominally won. But then. The wholeness fact, which was a faction of survivalists, got a lot of power and they started disrupting things. And it was just kind of one disruption after another after another that toppled sort of a weak system. And they, I think Gordon, in a lot of ways, becomes an unreliable narrator because he was pretty young when all this happened and he had a very distinctive, distinct perspective on the war that wanted for him to want to think that society was really rosy when it probably wasn't as rosy as he thought it was yeah and they in gordon blames i don't i don't think it's just him there was a couple of people that blame it on the wholeness where yes things were rough but you know they were just about getting right back to normal and the wholeness ensured that that never happened i don't find i don't find that very believable personally um even if you read um well they read a little bit of nathan hone's book who inspired all the wholeness we don't actually meet nathan hone hone in the uh book or the movie he's passed uh, he's passed on by this point but we we know we see his followers and it just doesn't seem like it would make much sense for them to like not seize the power that was left the the power structure that would have been left in place, even if it was weakened, it seemed like I'm sure they didn't help, but it seems, I don't know. I just don't find it believable that they were able to just, you know, topple the rest of it over. I, I, I agree with that. I think the whole nests were scavengers after the fact that they really took off after the collapse. And maybe they were a part, a part in the mix there, but I don't believe that, uh, like what, uh, Gordon says is that they they were about to go into a new ren- renaissance and a bunch of kooks in Europe and then the wholeness blew everything up to me. I, I just don't buy that. Yeah, I just, I, it doesn't. And even if you read like the bit that we get of the wholeness philosophy and it's it's kind of I don't know, it's a it's what I call like the Nietzschean right wing, I guess <laughs> like it's the best way I could describe it. It's uh, 
it's like quasi fascist um, outlook on the world. And it just doesn't make sense that they would be they would want I don't know, society to turn the way that it does in the movie and the book, it, their whole philosophy would be like, no, you seize control of the institutions that are left there and then mold society via that. Right. Does that that's the that's how I interpreted them. Yeah, I think that they were really and when everything went and fell, they were just picking off institutions that were still there. And then setting yeah. up feudal governments. I mean, that's what you even see in the in the movie is that uh, General Bethlehem, he's really just set up a feudal society, which was probably based, it really was based on what was already there. He puts different towns into his fiefdom where the sheriff of the town or the, the mayor, they just run the affairs entirely and he goes and collects tribute from them. I don't think they would have, to me in that scenario, I don't see how they would have been the the real topplers. Yeah. And the, I mean, the whole list in general, I find were one of the more interesting parts of the book and the movie, because in the book and the movie, they're presented as being, you know, like two dimensional bad guys. But yeah. if you know, if you know a little bit about this uh, where they're coming from and it's i guess you would say it's like the far right version of the history um but not really like it it, it, you can it starts with it starts before nietzsche but nietzsche but it really starts taking off there and i would say it's it's the it's like the far right version of history and how society functions mixed with atheism um and the their argument and if you're familiar with some of the far right arguments, the way they view history in terms of, you know, men are put on this earth to build empires, the, you know, the weak should serve the strong. Now, nobody really likes the fact that that's the case. But if you look throughout history, it's not it's not that far off. I mean, we're still we're still living with it right now. We just kind of live in a degree. We live with a normal uh, with the noble lie that's presented with uh that's presented in the movie too, where the postman's going to come and, you know, fix things up. But in reality, I mean, we still live under these types of rules, you know, like I don't have the same say as Jeff Bezos or the president of the United States. I kind of live underneath them. Yeah. We have the, we have the belief and, and, you know, you could say, well, that's a, that, that's the thing. We, we have to believe that we have a say in the democracy and that's what keeps, that's what separates us from the wholeness where you'll see plenty of countries around the world where it's whoever is the, the controller of violence is going to be the one who runs the society. And that's what the wholeness, they've entirely embraced that. They're not playing around that. Oh, we're, uh, you know, we're representing the people or we represent this, that General Bethlehem in the movie. And uh, he was more or less the same character, General Mackler in the book. They just completely embrace that, that whole mindset and that whole thought process were the might and what we, by being the might, we meant that's right. Yeah. Well, it, it, they take, they embrace it and they say, well, we're, we're not going to have any like pretenses about like, you know, we have the truth. This is this is at the core of it, stripped of all other type of meaning and social niceties and metaphysics. This is how the world runs, essentially like an animal kingdom. And we're the lions and you guys serve us. And I mean, if you look at how society runs, when we kind of strip it down to nothing, it's really, it's not much, they really not much has changed. And it, it's, it's tough to argue against it. I, you know, people, you know, you know, when we post the episode or, you know, leave comments or send us messages, but it's a really tough thing to tackle with. And I know I've, tackled to the tackled with this issue in my mind uh many times and over the course of the conversations me and you have had about uh things other than movies and it's a very difficult thing to come to grips with it becomes more stark too as you get closer to subsistence the in this society there are one a crop failure away from being wiped out or another big 
farming failure or another village coming and taking all of their stuff. I think things the, the you know, when you look at uh, Maslow's hi- hierarchy of needs and it, when you start getting down into those more base needs of food, shelter, that is security, the whole equation changes and how a society is going to work. And I would argue that the like the holists have an argument too, where the postman and you know the people that support the postman want to bring back a, a liberal democracy of some sort. Um, the they want a, a restored United States, and the holist argument would be, well, that's what created this whole situation to begin with. We should do the opposite of that. We should reject all of it. You know, like egalitarianism out the window hierarchy that's what society should be built on they they really settled it out too where it's it's not like wholeness and is some uh fiction of this novel i mean if you look at robert heinlein's novels uh starship troopers where service earns you citizenship it's a different perspective and what the postman is bringing through democratizing people with just communication. That's all he's doing is restoring communication lines. That is an existential threat to the wholeness. The wholeness sort of thrive in the dark because yep. the, their control really revolves around people not being able to organize and communicate they want people under their control and once people have the ability to communicate then that power structure is hard to maintain yeah 100 percent. and it, it's it becomes difficult to uh keep the rigid hierarchy which I, the wholeness is the basis of their society steve here again with a quick word from our sponsors The big thing with this movie, too, the movie and the the book is it's past. We're at least the book and the movie start at about 15 or 16 years past the fall. So not a terribly long time, but it's it's long enough to be in the trough of the fall. And maybe in a lot of ways, things are starting to tick upwards in in the book. They get into it a little bit more. I didn't. And that's maybe another departure with the movie. But you get kind of the sense that maybe things have settled and they're not getting worse. The environment's not getting worse. The the crops are starting to grow. And so what separates the postman from a lot of other post-apocalyptic movies and films are that things could be getting better now. And so how do you rebuild society that's fallen the the big lie, the lie that Gordon's telling is that in a way, it's already been done for you with the restored United States. And I think that that lie, and tell me what you think about this, is that lie came apart, I think, to the postman or to Gordon, because in a way, he desperately wants that to be true, even though he Gordon knows it's not true. And I'm sure Kevin knows that's not true either. Yeah. But it also, especially in Gordon's case, and we talked about this kind of in the Unbreakable series, is if you really, truly want something to happen, right, and it takes almost a superhuman type will to uh, to bring this forth into reality, what Gordon is really doing is he, he really wants the United States to come back. And he's using means that are at his disposal saying, well, the Postal Service is back and he's telling people this and through telling people this and actually creating other postmen, he is bringing this up to um, he is bringing this into reality. I think that maybe that's another thing we could talk about is Kevin Costner's postman. I don't know. He it's not until the very, very end that he really believes the lie. I think that he's spun the the. I think, and to tell me what you think about that, is that do you think that Kevin Costner's postman really believes that the Postal Service is of any value? I don't think at the beginning of the movie he, he really saw much value in it. Um, like, I do think that he wanted 
things to get better, right? As it, that's the saying, his saying in the movie, things are getting better. I, I do truly believe that he wanted them to get better. He just, he just figured that the issue, like the, the problem was way too big for him to even tackle, even if he really wanted to tackle it. Um, but as the movie progresses, I, I do, I do think that his character are, especially at the end, he does realize um at the core of it he did bring up he has somewhat started or brought about something that he wanted uh anyways which was a some version of the united states restored it, it took him time to grow into that i think that the the, the kevin kevin costner's postman it took him really until the the very final scene of the movie to realize what he had created that it it wasn't just a lie. I think the I think that Gordon Krantz in the book understood that a little earlier that the lie really had value. M- probably it, maybe by the s- last third of the book, he understood that the, that lie had value, and he maybe didn't love the idea of the lie, but he understood it. I think that Kevin Costner's character never really understood it until the end, the very end of the movie. And I think that almost in a way, he maybe never fully realized the lie. Maybe he thought he he was creating something entirely new. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it. I guess in the sense is one of the shortcomings of the film. It would have been, they didn't flesh out that part of the, uh, the they could have, with some different type of editing, I think they could have, they, that could have been made more clear in the movie i don't know what do you think yeah i think that the movie i mean we'll get into a couple of problems because that's really a part of the big story in this film is that it was a complete box office disaster kevin costner had i think maybe three monumental flops right in a row at about the same time that came close to wrecking his career i think and in this film it's almost it's three hours and ten minutes long and there's big chunks of the film where nothing really happens. I think, and I, I really do think in a lot of ways that we talked about this is that the movie could have been way longer, really, but they did not use their three hours very well. I mean, if you were to read reviews for The Postman, you would think this was like one of the worst movies ever made. And it's it's not even, I don't know, it's not even in that ballpark. Like if I, if you were to ask me my truthful opinion, I would say I would give it a seven and a half or an eight out of 10. Honestly, I really enjoyed the movie. I just think it, it really could have would use some work in the editing. There's this whole sequence in where him and his girlfriend or not girlfriend, Abby, or staying in this cabin and I'm watching and I'm like, well, I mean, they could have just cut this all out or they could have just done a one minute montage where, you know, he's recuperating in this cabin and their relationships growing. We could have got it, but it's like, I don't know. It was like 20 minutes long in the movie. Is it not? That was a big problem is uh, that I had with the whole movie is Abby in the book is she has a very small role in the book, but she's really key in that the postman, she uses him as a surrogate father. They, they, and this happens in the film as well, in that um, Abby's husband can't, they can't have a baby. And in this society, instead of having a different surrogate inside of the village, they'll often use capable looking outsiders to do that. I think that, and so in the book or in the movie, Abby's husband winds up getting killed. So then naturally, Kevin Costner and Abby can become uh, romantically involved. And they just, they stretched out the romance to just so far. Even if it was mildly interesting, and maybe there could have been a conflict built up there if her husband had lived once he was dead. And then it just turned into an ordinary romance. But it... Yes, uh, but I would say in the movie they she stole she stole in love with her her husband that was killed by uh, General Bethlehem, and she's struggling with her feelings for Kevin, and it's it takes her a little while to to accept the fact that she 
loves Kevin too. And there's a lot of sentimentality to it. The, one of the things I like about the movie, the postman is, and people might disagree with me on this. I think he, Kevin really nails melodrama. It's, it's a lot. I find it's a lost art in film. Now you don't see it done very well, very, uh, often and i really enjoy melodrama i like the big sweeping shots and the the music and just the, like the exaggerated emotions and the like the stump speeches like i don't see it in film very often nowadays i mean pro- maybe the postman is one of the reasons for it because it was such a box office bomb but yeah. uh it's it's not something you see very often and i really enjoy it i don't i don't like I'm not going to watch every single movie is going to be a melodrama, but I enjoy I enjoy it when it's done well and and bits and pieces. 